Thank you and good afternoon to all of you. Thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to begin by saying how important I think um, what uh, Fail Forum is doing because my perspective having to study in North America um, in the film studies department is that you always have the idea that Latin America only did political films and that they never did any experimental film. And because in the classes you're not shown experimental film, that means nobody's doing research on experimental film. And because there is no research in experimental film, therefore there is no interest and it doesn't exist. So I think that it's very important that um, the book and the screenings are uh, breaking um, this vicious circle of, you know, of showing there is nothing, therefore we don't do anything. Um, and for that reason, I think um, we, I would like to, to thank um, Adam uh, Hyman, as well as Jesse Lerner and Luciano Piazza for having dedicated so much time um, to create the book and to that, that now we have to see what experimental film in Latin America um, is about. Um, okay, and, and so I'm gonna just give you a little reference about these films, primarily because it's different from other uh, experimental works and performance art pieces in that it's really based in archival historical research. And I think it's a much more enriching text if I tell you a little bit more about um, what the sources are to what you're going to be seeing. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is a little bit about the Amazon River and the fact that uh, the co-script writer of this film, Luis Angel Duque, uh, had actually been in 30 out of the 32 uh, rivers that whose waters go into the Amazon. So we have again um, a person who knows very well the river, and, and you can see that in the film, you know, the river runs very different in the delta, the river then the mid Orinoco is, is different and, and even the sound that you're going to hear as, as the film travels to the source is different. But the same is true about the waters. The waters are going to be changing color from muddy waters to more transparent waters to absolutely clear waters. And, and there are several references in the book about this. And I would like to talk about two of the historical sources. Uh, that you're going to find in the river as the, um, as the leader of the Mabaka is having the vision quest and is seeing all the historical characters come in the river. The first one that he sees, they are in the historical order. So the first one is Colum Columbus, right? And Columbus gets to the Delta in six years after he arrives. So we are 1498, and he arrives to what today is the Delta El Orinoco, the Paria Mountains. And the things that are more, uh, that we hear more about Columbus' arrival, uh, when you know he arrives in three boats, in the film the boats are not there, you're only going to be seeing the sails. Once um, the first act that Spain, the Spaniards do as they come to the New World is the requerimento, which is to take possession of the land. And that's going to be the next thing that, that happens. And at that time, you're going to see a lot of Amazon uh, women coming up. But things that are less known is that um, come from Columbus journals. And one of the things that he was worried about is the water, the salinity of the water at the Orinoco Delta. And this is important because it's the first time that Colombo realizes that he has actually arrived in a continent, right? Because he's at the Delta, which is huge. And then the salinity of the water is, is, is not salty, so he knows he's not in the ocean. Therefore, with the uh, amount of water that is coming out, he, he knows he's in a continent and not in an island. So that's one important factor. And 
The other detail from the uh, journal is when he says that there is a mountain close to the Gulf, which is the delta of the Orinoco, that has the shape of the breast of a woman. And you can see that up as part of the uh, wonderful performance piece of Rolando Peña. And Rolando was here um, a few weeks ago, and then now you're going to see him in the screen. Now, the other person that is important in this historical account comes to Venezuela a um, hundred years after Columbus, and is Sir Walter Raleigh. And Raleigh comes from um, from England. And what happened is that uh, the governor of the island of Trinidad, which is next to the delta of the Orinoco, has written a letter to the emperor of Spain saying, you know what, I found El Dorado. And you have to give me more men to go and, you know, take El Dorado and all the riches to Spain. And this letter is intercepted by uh, pirates and Months after that, Raleigh is at the Delta del Orinoco. He takes Berrio, Antonio Berrio, prisoner, and takes him to the to to where he says the Dorado is. And of course, they couldn't pass at that time because the water level is too high. But anyways, Raleigh comes back to England and he publishes a book that is called. Uh, the discovery of the beautiful empire of Guayana with a relation to the city of Manoa, which the Spaniards call El Dorado. And we're talking about 1596. And this book is important, but it's not really the most important one uh, for the film. Three years after this book is published, um, there is a Belgium which I guess you're familiar with uh, Theodore de Brie, and, um, or de Brie, depending. And he has made a 14 volume history that is called Nuevo Mu New World, Nuevo Mundo. And, you know, the Raleigh's history is going to be part of that 14 volume. And the, the, um, the work that he's doing, which is an, uh, a much shorter account to the same trip, has illustrations. And those illustrations are the one that you're going to be seeing in the film. There is a close reference to those illustrations. And the first one that you're going to see right at the opening credits is a map of Guayana. Right? And in the map, you're going to see in the lower part, there's the mythical beings. There's two, two types of mythical beings. The acephaly, that's called the Ewapainama, and then the Amazon. And they are right there. And that's a map of the New World. Um, the second reference is to Queen Elizabeth I, which is the queen when Raleigh is coming to Venezuela, to the Delta del Orinoco. And although she was never in America, you're going to see her appear in, you know, with um, a lot of performance art, appear in a castle in the mid Orinoco. The third uh, reference to uh, debris work is the noblemen that are all in gold. And um, what um, the, what Debris says is that the, there was these, these noble men that before taking the bath they were blown gold and you're going to see that reference um, as well in the film. And then the last one is going to be a, a frontispiece, a portico that is very common in the work of Debris. And in it, I think it is very interesting, not, not just because it, it completely um, is totally out of place in the middle of the Amazon, but because it becomes a cabinet of curiosities. <laughs> and a cabinet of curiosities was used in the 1400 already and early 1500s to put objects that are unique objects that were coming from America. And whenever guests came, then you would see they were wonderful objects. This is pre-museum life, and they were in private homes. And 
you know, the, the portico to me is a piece of conceptual art because you have to get the pun, right? The pun is that the Europeans who normally collected all these objects are now collected objects in the Amazon. And you can see them in the portico in the negative spaces you see on the right hand side is going to be uh, the Rio and the Amazon, and on the other side is going to be Raleigh, who's actually played by Rizkep himself. You know, so the, the real point of the film is not that debris uh, make it, made the figures very elongated and, you know, but the real point is the power of representing America has switched hands from being in the hands of the Europeans like Debris that make all these books about the new world to being in the hands of a Venezuelan filmmaker who's actually painting and including inside it the European characters. And then just a very uh, a small reference of how the narrative works within the film because you have to always consider that it's a vision, what we're seeing as the historical characters, is a vision from the Macaba leader that dreams that all these people are coming through the river and the, the film ends with, uh, in a very sad note, thinking, you know, that they are gonna destroy a little bit the, the world um, that the people of the Amazon had. And, um, that's all. Okay. Um, where to begin? Yeah, that's right. Where to begin? Can you tell us something about uh, Rizquez's work with indigenous communities and actors? Because I think we've seen a lot of documentary films uh -huh. where maybe a cinematographer working with nonfiction representations. Yeah. But did he have some sort of intermediary, or he showed up and said, "Want to make this film?" No, um, they they flew in the crew with the cameras, the main, you know, the people for the sound. They took some sound, and they lived there for a month with the indigenous community. Um, now, they, I think that what you mean is the. Um, the leader having the, the dream, the vision quest. Uh, he is such a powerful man. And he is actually, at the time, he was the leader of the Macaba Nation. And then he became the leaders of the leaders of the Yanomamis and other communities. So he is a very strong um, person who had actually a vision of you know what to do with the community and where to go, and his um, his status has increased ever since they made the film. And so they flew in, and um, they every week or so the helicopter came back, and then they have to go like a couple of days in the Curiara in that boat. Um, and so they were living there before because they had um, Super 8 cameras and the Super 8 cameras were operated with batteries. They, they had a long battery life. And you know, they, they can change the batteries and, and they could complete, keep shooting, yeah. But I guess my question is also about the sort of process of, you know, these aren't professional actors. No. So he was workshopping with them beforehand or he explained, um, he had some sort of intermediaries that were... Um... Um, well, I am not sure about that. What I've seen is a lot of film they didn't use. So I think it was more open and free than that. You know, they start shooting, they, you know, and, and then they move along and then from there they edit. So I don't think there was a lot of direction. And I think that's, that's, that's more generally what happens with Rizquez. He kind of lets people do whatever they think is the best they can do within the framework of what they are doing. So they probably were just shooting, you know, um, for the month that they were there and then 
then there's some sort of improvisational element yes as well. i think so and at the in the end credits they describe that final sequence with the sun and the moon and the yeah jaguar and the i know being, um, the mythological, mythological tribes tribe. so S at that point he's no longer basing this on yeah, on on the Europeans, this is coming in and put in another mythology. This is his yeah, own mythology that he invented. Yeah. Okay. Well, I th I think he he's taking more of a um, pan Latin Americanism. This the sun, the moon, and the Popol Vuh, and this comes from the performance pieces that he did before. He did one uh, for the festival, for the Super A festival, that was called Men of, of Corn, based in the Popol Vuh, and then he will interact with the audience with, I think, like 50 kilograms of corn, and then give corn to everybody, and that was, and while there was a projection of, of corn in, in Super 8 in the background. So could you tell us a little bit about his trajectory before making these three feature films? Okay, so before that, um, these feature films, uh, they are roughly every five years, so 80, 85, and 89 is the, the one you guys are gonna see on Monday. And he started as an artist and he did color copy, um, um, he worked with photocopies and they books of colors in, and then also he did a lot of, um, it was part of the uh, non-objectual art that it was being done also in Colombia, you know, trying to take the uh, art outside of the museum. Um, and so that that's the, there is a little bit of that in this film in terms of frames. So they will hand frames that were empty space, right? And and then he did one performance piece for every year of the Super A Fest Festival, which was 76, 78, 79. Um, the first one that was about Bolivar, Bol it was called Bolivar Peen. Although it says haciendo pipi, which sounds much better in Spanish, and um, that was canceled, and it was a little fountain, you know. Um, then he did hombres de maíz, then, which was just performance and projection with um, super eight in the background, and then. Um, uh, the one about the water. Um, a propósito, so then there is one about Reveron, the painter, and it's all about lights and lights and mirrors. And before that, he did um, one about the water. And very poetic, um, super eight. So performance pieces, and then and then, and then two films, and then the long feature, the Bolivar. And it sounds like he, when was it in Caracas that there was that international encounter of the non-object, non-object-based art? Well, yeah, that I think was in, actually, it was in Colombia. Oh, that's in Colombia? Okay. Yeah, that was in Colombia, and what was in Caracas was the festival, which happened every August. And, um, and it was part of that performing art scene then. Yeah, he was part of the performing art scene which tend to be more towards the 80s, right? And and the Radical Women, for example, had a, a fantastic piece um, by uh, G uh, Jenny and Jang, the, the, the water that's performing within the water. So they had a very strong community of performing artists there. And, and Risquet was part of um, Tiempo Común, and you know, the priest that is being killed, he was uh, Hugo Marquez and he was the director of uh, Tiempo Común, which... It's an experimental... It's experimental group, but actually they, um, they did performances in the streets. So it's, it's called Teatro de la Calle. So they work in the streets. Are there questions from the public, people in the audience? Want to hear more about Rizquez's background or the film itself? Yeah, about the film. I, I forgot to mention that um, 
and it, and it kind of surprised me because I have my own version of the film already in my mind, right? And when I see it again, I say, oh, you know, and um, Raleigh, when he comes, he comes with um, a little, a girl, and that's Risket daughter, which of course is not part of the historical um, account. And she's wearing a veil uh, because Risket say, well, you know, I, I, I didn't have enough money to do the to do the film every year, so I shot a little bit every year. And so if I cover her face, you couldn't tell that she was growing. And I was looking at it, and, <laughs> and you know, by the end of the film, she's taller. Yeah. And at the, when you get to that final tableau vivant with the arches, and yeah, he finally pulls up the veil. Exactly. And instead of uh, skin, it's like a, she's like a statue. She she's a golden statue because this is the place where all the people are looking for El Dorado, right? You have the El Dorado in the middle, then then the two Doradistas, the the coming from different countries, and then even the, the his daughter is um, golden. So I, I would like to hear, uh, you know, I'm writing about this, a, a chapter of my book about um, this film, and I would like to know your reaction, if you could tell me, well, you know, I thought this or that, or I was surprised by this, or that will be, that will help me, actually. I'm always curious to see the film from a perspective that's not mine. I thought the way that, I thought the way that the... No, I think, I, I don't hear well, so I'm gonna give you a mic, and you can pass it around. Well, we have, we have one, sorry. I think oh, there's a, a mic for the... <coughs> there we okay. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. I was very struck by the way that uh, the figures, especially uh, the Europeans, um, interacted with the terrain. And I, I thought that was very interesting that uh, the trees... Say it again? The way that the um, people, especially the Europeans, um, interacted with the, the, um, the jungle. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the terrain, just, uh, you know, the way that some especially knowing that there was a fair amount of improvisation going on, the way that they positioned themselves, but also the way that they um, um, were kind of joining it in some ways, or at least yeah. discovering it. And I thought that was very interesting. Uh, beyond, beyond the tablet, well, beyond the implied narrative aspects. You're, you're thinking about uh, Mont Blanc and Humboldt when they are in the tree? Yeah. As well. oh, okay. But there are other examples too. Uh, there are actually a lot of that throughout the film. Uh, and it's also the way that they um, populate the spaces. The spaces, um, you know, of, uh, of different, um, well, different parts of, of the jungle or parts of just, uh, or for that matter, the seascape too. You know, I just think yeah. that they're very much in the environment. I yeah. think that's very interesting. Yeah, the landscape. That's why um, I think that to a certain extent, the film is really about the river. You know, the river and all uh, what is within the river. You know, the water, the different personalities of the different parts of the river, different uh, fauna. Yeah. Thank you. That was. Well, you mentioned these three Super 8 competitions in the late 70s. Yeah. Um, can you tell us more about the sort of Super 8 community in Venezuela at that time? Well, the Super 8 community in Venezuela was part of a much larger group um, that was called the International Federation of Super 8 Cinema. And so Venezuela, uh, Caracas, actually began um, with a very close link with um, Super A Filmmaker, which was a magazine that was read <coughs> over here, and I think it was published in California. And um, then what the director of Caracas did is put an ad in Super A Filmmaker, and he got a lot of uh, films from uh, California. Uh, for the first two um, film festivals, 
and then he was invited to Iran and in Iran he start, um, he met all the film festival directors uh, of Europe and, and then it ended up being also North Africa and then the, the Philip then uh, Hong, uh, Japan, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. And at that time also Australia became part of um, the Federation. So they were by, by just, the... Just yeah. to clarify, when you say all the film festival directors, these are directors of Super 8 film festivals? Yes, they were exclusively, this was a circle, this was a grassroots exhibition circle. And they were only, um, yeah, it's what you say in your book, that they were completely identified with the medium. So it was only Super 8 at these festivals. And the Federation worked from 75, that was created in Iran, to 89, in which Kodak stopped producing Super 8. And then, um, well, it, it's, you know, Kodak stopped selling Super 8 in different countries at different times. For example, uh, in Brazil, they stopped selling Super 8 at, in 83, whereas in New York, I think you, you, can, you could buy it in very specialized shop, shops, but till the 90s. Howard Gutenplan told me that he was buying it even, you know, in the 21st century. Yeah. You can still buy it. You can still buy it. I think that Kodak now gives you a deal that you buy it, it lends you the camera, and then it digitizes it for you. It's a thing, but the, the old style Super 8 is still available. Some of it is still available. Some of the styles are still available now. Yeah. yeah. So with Super, when the Caracas Super 8 group had their festivals, would filmmakers from Iran and the Philippines and Hong Kong come and present their work? Or? Okay, so what happened was that, um, first of all, Iran had the revolution, so they couldn't have the festival anymore, and then Caracas became the main place to gather Super 8 filmmakers. And so they had like four or five festivals every year, and what they did, because um, Super 8 could not be copied, it, it was more expensive to copy a, a film than to make a new film, and so the film festival directors travel with the copies in their hand luggage from festival to festival. And once they were, you know, and the Federation worked without money. So what happened was the festival directors were invited to another festival as jurors or to give a workshop. And they do, did a double function. On the one hand, they brought the films and then they did something in the other festival. And the festival paid for most of the trip and probably for lodging as well. And would you characterize the work that was being shown at these festivals as being principally experimental, or was there narrative work and documentary work and a whole range of things? Or? It, was, it, it was very, very mixed. Um, you have people doing human rights. It was the beginning of human rights, so some people some that, that were doing third cinema, right, political Latin American cinema, they got in into Super 8 and did a little bit of that work that then in the 80s became um, human rights. Um, they were, um, the gay movement was beginning at that moment and then you, you had co-production with uh, the, Bel the, the people from Brussels that went to make a film in Tunisia. Um, they made uh, love stories. Um, uh, then uh, what else? So then you have some experimental work which was done mainly in Brazil and in Caracas. So the people from Caracas will come, you know, to see if they could win the, the, the people from Sao Paulo will come to see if they could win the people in Caracas, which were supposed to be the, you know, this, this kind of warfare, the, the strongest. And then you had animation, mainly done in Brussels um, and also in England, uh, a little bit of Super 8 in France, uh, so you have a mix of everything. And I know in the sort of contemporaneously in Mexico there are these debates about uh, people writing manifestos and saying, you know, Super 8 filmmaking is 
supposed to do this and this is our role as Super 8 filmmakers and anybody doing something else is misguided. Um, was there that kind of polemic going on in Caracas at the time or was it more... No, it, it, it was much cars? more fluid. Okay. It, it, it was Gumusio doing um, a little bit of um, community work with workers in Nicaragua, um, but in general you could present whatever you wanted. Some people were doing still surrealist personal films, um, and then there was political film of Julio Neri who was doing long feature films and then blowing them up to 35 and competing in Latin American um, festivals. But there was no manifestos because it was much more open. It was, it was political in the sense that they wanted to create a very strong non-parallel uh, system to commercial filmmaking and that was and they thought that everybody could contribute to this so you didn't have that was their manifesto and it was not written but it would say okay if we get together and we get this circulation um, exhibition system parallel exhibition system in which we invite each other to the festival we can survive as filmmakers and that was their thing and they were open to whoever wanted to do something I mean. and we know that Venezuela right now is going through this particularly complicated, difficult time politically yeah. and economically. Exactly. But can you give us a sense, though, about what is the status of you know kind of archival preservation or I, I don't restoration? I think about it. Oof. So well, these okay, I, I will tell you. I'll tell you. So this government was not very keen on experimental work. Um, they defended a very clear realist. You're talking about the current government. The government, yeah, yeah, the socialist, um, it would, since Chavez on, right? right? Um, be, okay, l let me begin before that. Uh, before that, um, Venezuela was one of the countries that defended Supra the most. It was a country that had um, the festival at the Cinemateca, which is the national exhibition center, whereas in other people, you know, like in, in, in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, they had to go from theater to theater every year trying to, you know, get funds. No, Super 8 was big in um, Venezuela because the government was very invested in showing uh, Super 8 outside and because Risquet was winning in Cannes. Risquet, with the other film, with Bolivar Sinfonia Tropical, he opened Can to Super 8. It was the first time, because of him, that, that really they started to show Super 8 in Can. And, and so that was, you know, for an oil producing country that wanted to be a fir first world filmmaking country, that was like. And then they even had a representative of Super 8 that they sent with Super 8 films all around the country and to other countries. So Germán Carreño, for example, went to Sao Paulo with um, Bolívar carrying the film. Uh, so, so that government, at the same time, had a policy of preservation. And it was beautiful, the fantastic facilities. Um, they preserve a lot of Super 8 up until things started not to work very well in Venezuela and they didn't, they started not to have uh, money and that was in 2006 they started to be clear that but in 2006 you still will go to the archives and you have to put a coat you know and that means they had air conditioning as it went to 2014 they didn't have enough money to keep the air conditioning, even not just in the big um, archive, but in the specialized places where they put the, the important work. So, so the vaults are kind of controlled. Yourself. Exactly. And the film. I know, I know. That's why I didn't want to tell the story, but that's. We well, sometimes there is a little bit of air conditioning, uh, but for the majority, I mean, they don't have with the devaluation of the Bolivar, they, they, they don't have money to eat. And 
definitely there is a policy from the government of not supporting art, except their own art, which is, you know, much more of a propaganda, and in, in my view, and very realist film, and they wouldn't, you know. And Risque uh, wrote an open letter against uh, against Maduro, which, you know, might not help the situation. Uh, he, well. I don't think they threw his films away, but... Those are put him at the top of the list of things yeah. to preserve. I haven't read it, but they, that's what he told me, yeah. Okay. Um, can you talk about some of the relationships with other Super 8? I mean, I mentioned the scene in Mexico, and I know some of the Mexican filmmakers yes. participated yes. and were you know, they, they rejected third cinema and political cinema and cinema that they felt was propagandistic. Yeah. But at the same time, there was some kind of um, tension mm -hmm. with the Venezuelan makers, right? Oh, really? Well, um, I think a lot of the work seemed too arty, too yeah. normally um, preoccupied with form, um, not necessarily useful within a social or political struggle. Yes. And there might have been uh, sort of contrasting class positions where because of all the money that was coming into Venezuela because, because of, of the oil. petroleum, yeah. because of the oil exports that, um, I mean, many of the Mexicans sort of rejected that scene yeah. as being, you know, they were petty bourgeois, self-indulgent, I'm paraphrasing something. That yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that rejection was also present in, in Venezuela itself, you know, um, they say that. They, but I think that the way I see Mexico from the Federation, which is this um, exhibition uh, circle, um, Mexico was three years, uh, according to Alvaro Vázquez Mantecón, right? 81. 80, 81, and 82 as part of the Federation. And then from what I understand is that Mexico had a lot of options for filmmakers that Venezuela didn't have. You know, they, they have a National Institute of Cinematography who provide some films. There was support for anthropological films from the INI. There was 35 you know, people went to film schools and they made 35 films. There was a whole generation of women filmmakers. And these were options that in the super eight countries were not open. Like if you go to Tunisia, for example, um, that option definitely is not there. Or, you know, so, so countries that had very strong 60 millimeter and 35 millimeter cultures, they didn't need Super 8 because they could use 16 and they could get better pictures. So, at Canada, for example. And right? I suppose the other thing that you need to calculate in here is that by the time you talk about the early 80s, there are an awful lot of video cameras out there. So some people that might have started out in Super 8 yeah. realized that you know, for what it costs to buy, you know, five cartridges of yeah three minutes each of Super 8, I could buy a whole box of VHS or... Yeah, well, that's actually reflected in this organization, which in 1985 becomes open to, to video. So at that point, video was very comparable and it was being more used but there were still the people who say, well, you know, we just like the, the, the images that film can give you. We don't want video. But yeah, by, by 85, the battle be between video and Super 8 is, is just turning towards video. Although it seems like Gris case is in 1989, he's still making a feature film at Super 8. It's Super 16. Super 16, okay. Don't yeah, so you see that there is already the jump to, and if you look at his three films, the first one, Oliver, he edited in Super 8 and put the soundtrack in Super 8. 
um, Orinoco, he shot it in Super 8, but the edition, they, they already blow it up to 35, and they edited in 35. And then the next one, it was already <coughs> shot, because by that time, um, somebody gave him some money to shoot the film, and then he used 16. So, just a little bit more. Anything uh, about the character, the history? I was just... When I was looking again at the film, I was thinking that, if, for example, we think about Derek Jarman and um, other films at that time, I think that the part that strikes me the most is they trying the, the conceptual art part. They they they're trying to question the representation of Latin America within um, within Europe. And I was, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm not a filmmaker, so I'm not sure about Super 8 and all those sorts of things. But I guess I, um, what really kind of stood out to me was like the, at the end, the symbolism of the jaguar and the parrots and then the birds and the water and the sun and the moon. And I thought back to when I was little, we went to vacation in Mexico City and we were at the pyramids and they talked a lot about the jaguar, the jaguar and the, the spirit powers. And I, I was wondering if he's had put them towards the end. Um, it'd be to symbolize like, even though the Europeans had come and they were, you know, enjoying the earth, taking from the earth, taking from um, the continent, that the spirit powers were still there, that the jaguar was still there, that the, 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 the cats were still there, the birds, the spirit, the, the water, the people, you know, they were kind of surrounding the Europeans, they come so they were observing, okay. and that the spirit powers were still there. And I was wondering if he, how he, um, if he set up those scenes, if he had put in, put thought into um, just the different layers of the culture and the spirits and kind of what was taking place historically. Does that make sense? Um, okay, the different, so the different your scenes. question is why is the, the last section with the um, indigenous mythology at the end and how does it relate to the other? Yeah, and kind of how he um, kind of organized the scenes and kind of how he conceptualize the different scenes of why he did what he did in Yeah, uh, I couldn't answer you uh, that question because I was asking myself the same question. Um, so I don't know. All of a sudden, it has not been that way, but all of a sudden, do you get the indigenous mythology and he lost me in that part. But it does seem like that's one of okay. those moments where, you know, if some of the references are very specific, right? Yeah. Uh, trying to figure out if the mouth of the Orinoco River is a strait between two islands. Yeah. Or, you know, if it's fresh water, that means it's a river and it's we're yeah. a continent and uh, we're no longer in the Caribbean. Uh, yeah. So island there. Um, so there's some very sort of specific historical references. Yes. Like the Debray. The and then there are moments like that last sequence where it seems like. Mm -hmm. Um, it jumps from that sort of specificity to, you know, because that's not a specific indigenous uh, pantheon of deities. It seems like at that point it's the Americas rather yes, than, yes. you know, the Yamaha. It's not the Orinoco, it's the right. Americas. It's the Americas, and this film is then to be understood not as these series okay. of moments in the European conquest of the Americas, but as like the history of the conquest of the Americas. Yeah, yeah, well that's very convincing, I think. Well, I, I guess, when, I guess when, in response, I guess, I kept getting a sense of like the power of fertility, like a lot of the water, the fruits, even like at the end when she was like laying there, kind of the, the water's coming kind of like from her body. Like there was so much power in the, in the land and then, and then the people and then the culture. Just kind of the people, just the fertility, just the strength of the water and the land and the birds and the animals and so much power. I got a lot of sense of like a lot of power and strength, kind of energy from the land and the people. Yeah, I think that if you think about the film as a dream, as a quest, then you can understand those images in, in as part of that dream, or you know, you have more flexibility to think about the images. Like, you know, are these being part of the dream, or are they? Or I, are they part of our trip up the up the river as we go towards the source? 
And so I think it's a very ambiguous, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. But, yeah, but they, they, as you were saying, they are very, very strong and powerful, the land in terms of, which is what you were saying too. But I would say in addition to being a dream, it's also a hallucination, right? Yeah, exactly. The, the sequence at the beginning where the powder is being blown the juggle. Right, that that's a hallucinatory plant. Yeah. Um, that's indigenous to the Amazon. Yeah. And then, you know, the whole arrival of Columbus and the European conquest becomes this sort of bad trip. Yes. But is it true then that um, the indigenous pantheon is part of a bad trip? Or is it? Is it still the hallucinatory trip, or? It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell, yeah. Yep. I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's these metaphorical moments throughout the film. I mean, it's interspersed through the film. Something earlier is with the Columbus caressing the mermaid with the, which just, Oh, obviously it's purely symbolic, but it's also a way of like bringing in types of imagery that are in Debray and then the naked indigenous people, but while at the same time being a very sort of pure metaphor for what the Europeans are going to come in mm -hmm. and do, sort of molest and take from what they find here. Thoughts on that? Why the use of a mermaid suddenly? Is that something yeah. present in any of this other <laughs> symbolism at the time? Why the use of a mermaid? Um, I think that at least, it, it, okay, the mermaid is part of the historical um, chronicles. So, is there, um, I don't know that the moon and to my knowledge, the, the, the moon and the sun are not part of the chronicles. Although perhaps as beliefs that people have. So that is um, a little bit different. Yeah, go ahead. Save you have time for about one more. Okay, one more question. And then, yeah. This has nothing to do with the mythology, but the fact that there was no dialogue. Are most of the Super 8s, are they all without dialogue, or was this just an anomaly? Um, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Well, what happened was that um, one of the problems of Super 8 is that when you cut the film, you cut the soundtrack, but the soundtrack, you have the image in here, and the soundtrack was before. And so when you cut it, you get, it's very complicated to edit. So it's much easier to shoot it and then put a soundtrack that goes along than to try to, because it was synchronic sound, but, but hard to edit. So many of them, what they do is they calculate a song and first, and then they create the images for that song. And in this case, it was shot before and then the soundtrack uh, um, added after it was the whole thing was edited and it, it, it otherwise it was very hard although there are some people who actually learn how to shoot to leave enough space they they shot the scene already knowing how they were gonna edit it so they started the scene a little bit before and they left a little bit of space at the end so they could cut and not cut the sound which is and in that case you could overcome the difficulty of the sound of Super 8, but it was very hard to edit sound. And in this way, you didn't have to deal with it. Thank you. Yes? I think yes. Like vision. So you're not gonna be hearing, you're gonna be like kind of floating and observing the vision. That's why there was many talking. That's kind of how I experienced no talking. There was the vision, you're participating in the vision. So. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming thank and for asking questions. <laughs>